The Circus Diaries video ident has clips of trapeze, tight wire, books, big tops and a cup of tea. Hello, Kate here and I am back in the UK. For the last couple of weeks I've been posting videos from my experience developing audio description for visually impaired audiences for circus performance over in Canada. And I've posted our process, some of the feedback from audiences, but I thought I'd also share a video based on the experiences and the feedback of the um, circus artists participants in the devising process. Um, because I find it interesting, but also I think for people who might be coming to look at developing this work for themselves or researching this kind of practice, yeah, it could give some interesting considerations. So, um, all we do in the video is sit around in a circle and we go between different members of the group who want to share something. Led by the artistic director of the project, Marie-André Robitaille. And we start with juggler and acrobat Maggie B. Carlin. When I heard that we were going to be, that making the show accessible to people <coughs> was a priority, I got really, really excited because uh, accessibility is something that I think about a lot and that's important to me. People in my family work with people with mental, mental and physical disabilities, so I'm kind of aware um, a lot of the time that what I do is so visual that it's hard to share with um, a lot of people because like, deaf people can't hear you, and even blind people can't see what you're doing. So I was, first of all, I was just excited about that. And then what made me, uh, what really struck me was when Alex was talking, we were talking through something with Alex, uh, and she mentioned like, oh yeah, so much accessibility is an extra thing that's available for the people that need or want it. Um, and it's supposed to be invisible for the regular audience. Like we're pretending we make it accessible, but we're not going to bother anyone else with the accessibility because no, no, no. And then there's a woman whose name I've completely forgotten in a wheelchair last night at the talk back. Um, yeah. And she made a comment um, being like, oh yeah. And I would close my eyes and just listen to the audio description and hear mm -hmm. the noises on stage. And it just struck me that I was like, that's what we were trying to do. We were trying to make it so the accessibility makes the show better. Uh, and the accessibility is visible and part of the artwork. Um, and she also made a really good analogy where it's like, oh yeah, you might not need a wheelchair ramp, but it's fucking useful sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like you're glad to have that ramp when you're pulling a cart up the stairs. And it's like, you know. Um, and it's, it's making me think <coughs> about how I want to do that more and how I want things to be accessible by their nature um, and less like, I mean, that's obviously not possible with everything, but like if we can make things accessible by their nature instead of trying to tag that on at the end where it's like, oh, we forgot about wheelchair people, let's fix that for them. Um, if you make things with everyone in mind, it's just, um, that's something I love and that makes me feel really good about this week. There's a, a company that I work, um, have worked uh, a lot with in the UK called Grey Eye. Dr. Tina Carter is an aerialist, teacher and researcher. Um, and they have um, evolved over the years. They started off as, a, as quite a political sort of advocacy group um, uh, fighting for uh, deaf and disabled people to have access to the arts and have become uh, a really prominent uh, leader in the arts internationally. Um, and one of the thing, one of the terms that they use is um, uh, aesthetics of access. Uh, can't speak. Aesthetics of access. So the aesthetics of access are exactly that, which are um, how do we, how do we create a performance that, uh, from its very outset, considers access for all. Um, there's another company called Access for All, which are based in the same building. Um, and uh, so it, uh, the way Jenny Seeley works, who's the artistic director, um, she, uh, she's deaf and she, so she has sign, signers on, with her most of the time. Mm -hmm. So BSL, which is sign language, is, is often incorporated within a performance. Um, it might be, so one of her performances, for example, had um, two sets of actors playing the same characters. 
Mm. One set of characters spoke, the other set of characters used the BSL. Mm. So the same, and sometimes they would switch. So the same, so you had two people playing the same character, but they would use different forms of communication throughout that. Um, uh, and there are different ways that they incorporate. And, and I would really, you know, if you are interested in access um, and the aesthetics of it, I, I would really um, urge you to, um, to see their work, because a lot of it's online. And they've just published a book. And a certain somebody's got a little piece of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, What's it called? Uh, it's, uh, it's reason grey eye G R A E A E. Um, can you, uh, I can yes. I can room? I can put a little something on that. It's just Thank because you. I think they've got um, they've done a lot of exploratory work in it, um, and uh, since two thousand and eight two thousand and nine, um, Jenny got really involved in circus. And the reason she got involved in circus was because she saw a co an Australian company called Strange Fruit. I don't know if you know mm, them, Sway yeah. Pole Company. And Strange Fruit were working with Grey Eye, but all of the people who were on the Sway Poles were non-disabled. Mm. And, and uh, Jenny saw somebody signing in the crowd going, why is there no deaf person on the, on the pole? And she said, yes, why not? Why isn't there? So in the Paralympic opening ceremony of London 2012, we had uh, not only deaf people on the sway poles, we had blind people on the sway poles, we had paraplegic people on sway poles. So, um, you know, in, in terms of to really, really trying to push the boundaries of what is possible, amputees would be clambering up and then holding the, their various limbs in the air whilst on the sway poles. So it's, so it's yes. I'm, I'm, Anyway, I'm just sort of advocating that there's, there's a really strong history, which may not be Canadian, but that internationally, and certainly in the UK, there's a really strong... And the circus, yeah. So we, in, in the UK, we have quite a strong and an increasingly growing um, accessible circus, um, predominantly in a, in, a, um, in a social circus setting, but Grey Eye have really been pushing the boundaries um, in terms of uh, the professionalism. Natayu Mildenberger is an acrobat and dancer. Um, I was explaining how um, I realized how important this um, creation showing became for me um, just because why not involve, like circus should be for everyone, even if you have a disability, like just because you're blind doesn't mean you can't see circus or have the experience, you know? So this whole creation process is like so important and it's like this change and we're so like we're all involved in this change. I was just talking about how I hope that doesn't end tonight. I hope it's like continuous and keeps evolving because it's important. Everyone deserves to have this experience. So. Uh, I thought it was important for you that, to hear him uh, because uh, I mean this workshop uh, this is one of the outcome that mm -hmm. another circus artist realized that hey, but yeah, I'm you know so yeah. This is Jen, dancer and clown. It's exciting and it's made me think differently about my next work and how I might approach making it accessible. Ida Kramer is a Chinese pole acrobat. Yeah. Think about it now. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. so, Sarah performs on vertical rope. I like that this really um, opens up the stage for multidisciplinarity to be like a high priority because okay, you can't see something. What are you carrying? You know, like um, 
multidisciplinarity is something that I, I automatically think about because of my art school training, but I very much, uh, I interact with a lot of people who come from very specific disciplines, so I'm, I'm, um, I'm always interested in those, how those conversations kind of gel and come together and what languages we can create together. Like I love, I love putting it on display, right? Like we're very much putting on display, like this is the process that we are working through and we are addressing um, accessibility. Um, but I also am clued in to the like, okay, like, well once we get past that hurdle, what are we talking about? <laughs> you know, like, like it's one thing to point at, this is us talking about accessibility, but then like what are we all talking about as a community um, beyond that, that have, is the common threads, um, and can get past that just like, okay, cool, I'm happy we are celebrating difference, like, awesome, we are doing that. Um, but then what? <laughs> um, so, so those are some things that I think about as well. Um, uh, and then the third sort of um, topic that it has kind of been on my mind with this, um, you know, I'm, I'm very used to, like I've, I've been in, you know, I've traveled a bunch, I've been in some different immersive processes, I'm used to kind of like always feeling a bit out of sync with it but having to kind of like, okay, these are my self-care like tactics, you know, and I've gotten better and better at them over the years. However, things still come up. So, um, so that, that leads me to open, you know, the discussion it goes beyond just what we do in our day to day, but also into like the infrastructure that we put in place. And um, you know things like uh, that have to start from like the grant writing process in order to make things you know a certain kind of accessible. And um, it's always this battle of resources, right, to accomplish everything. We always want to accomplish like as much as possible for the time that we have, and all of that stuff. Um, but um, you know, like physical bodies have limits. <laughs> um, the, and, and they might be limits that change all the time. So there's like a, a, a reflexiveness, you know, kind of like um, in thinking about infrastructure and, and process that um, that maybe we need to be a little bit more prepared for. Um, uh, because often we can kind of like get a momentum and get on a train, you know, like I could be like falling off the train and like it's still going, you know. Um, luckily this week, week um, like it was a big challenge for me and a big test of like okay where is my energy really at how can I handle this and I I have fared surprisingly well and I'm, I'm really thankful for that um, but I've certainly had lots of experiences where I've gotten like really sick and then just worked through it and then like ate that and not really talked about it and um, and so I'm trying to become I've, what, what also has been nice about this process is that it's like an open discussion about accessibility and so I've been a bit more comfortable mm -hmm. being like, yeah, I feel oh, right now. <laughs> like, and I, I've said that to a couple of, you know, like um, people who were in my group, you know, I had a moment where I was like feeling really nauseous and then you we were like about to do a thing and I, I just said it and I was like, okay, we're just going on and it was fine, you know, which is often how that goes too. But, um, but I'm being a little bit more vocal since we're in this context and that has been like helpful to me as a person. <laughs> I thought it was um, really good to hear you saying that these things need to be considered from the grant writing part of the process because this sort of five days that we've had has been brilliant but we're discovering something on day three which we go oh now we'd have to put that ten weeks ago and we discover something on day four that oh we should have done that you know on day one um, so I guess for people who are thinking about continuing this work it's always to allow more time than you think there needs to be. Erin Ball was part of the audio description 
team and she has a double amputation below the knee. Um, I think moving forward and in the future, uh, communication and maybe setting guidelines from the beginning yes. is, is something to consider. Because I didn't know, you, like, I didn't even understand you would be with us in the circle and I don't know why I assumed that you would be observing us from, you know. I think that's because how access has usually been yes. seen in the context yeah. of the yes. arts world. That's the norm that's, that's been established. And finally, we hear from producer of the whole Circus Sessions project, Holly Tredenick. The final outcome, like all the steps that go to arrive where we arrived last night, is not what I completely envisioned, but the show wing is totally how I had envisioned before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> even met in the room and the way you're doing the scribing is totally what I had in my head how I thought it would pan out which is funny because I guess we never I guess I didn't transmit that to you and maybe that's a good thing but it's it's, it's funny without saying it is what happened closing credits appear on a weathered pink and grey starburst the circusdiaries.com also on Facebook and Twitter